is a presentation that um, we've now done uh, effectively three times, um, once on Saturday with Yarra Yarra, and then today, uh, earlier today, Siobhan ran through it with um, PPE, uh, PPW, and uh, now it's your turn tonight. So it's becoming um, something that um, we um, hopefully will be a useful resource. Um, there is another tool developed by another one of um, Yarra Yarra and um, PPW's people, Rob Nosco, who used to work for Synod, which is more in the case of, um, okay, what do you actually do on a practical level? And it's a bit of a how-to guide. So I think between this and that, there's some good information there, as well as us being available at the end of the phone line. So I'll step through this fairly quickly tonight because it will be available to you. Um, so this is about ESMs, essential safety measures. Um, the, the question comes up, what actually is an ESM? Um, why are they important? How do they interrelate with um, occupational health and safety? What do you have to do at a church level? Um, why does it apply to us? Um, how does it sit within the church, who we are under our regulations? Um, what um, help can you get from property services? And um, what have we done to date to try and support the process? Um, essentially, an essential safety measure is something that is intended to keep people safe in the event of an emergency. So if there's a fire, it's about keeping people safe. It's not about protecting the building or um, assets. It's about making sure people don't die in a fire or other untoward events. So whilst it's a disturbing um, prospect in terms of cost and activity that you have to undertake, if you remind yourself it's about keeping people alive and safe, um, that probably helps um, ease some of the financial pain. Um, there's a range of things that are commonly um, described as ESMs, um, smoke alarm systems, fire exit doors and signage associated with those. Um, various techniques and um, equipment um, need to be maintained. So the maintenance regime is as important as having the facilities actually installed to preserve safety mm -hmm. and um, life and limb. Um, there are teeth in the legislation now which are getting sharper and longer. Uh, because the hall was built after that, Mm. Um, was that a question there or was that a comment in the background? We keep going. Yep. Um, ESMs, there's a list of them there. They can um, be physical things, they can be systems, they can be electronics in the building, they can be as simple as a sign, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the important thing around essential safety measures is that they, they aren't just things people dream up. They are regulated and they are identified by a qualified person called a building surveyor. Um, these days, since 1994, when an occupancy permit is issued for a building, the building surveyor specifies what the ESMs are and writes them on the occupancy permit and in the form of a schedule of what they are and how you need to maintain them, how regularly and what needs to be done to maintain them. As such, they are unique to a building. So what you do for one building may well be different for another building, given the population, the size, and the use of the building and its age and stage and facilities. They have to be retained rather, regardless of whether we've got a building that is being used or otherwise. So at the present time, uh, many of our buildings are not being used. That does not mean that we don't have to maintain the ESMs in the buildings, so no matter how difficult that might be while we're uh, locked in our homes. They are essentially, as I said earlier, they're a first line of defence in keeping people safe and alive. The worst um, event you can have typically is a fire. That's the most dangerous event in a building in terms of life and limb. And uh, believe it or not, we have actually had fires in UCA buildings. Um, so don't think it's something that happens to the other person. It happens to us as well. Um, they come under the Building Act and regulation in Victoria. Um, they're also nationally driven in a lot of the construction code requirements. The types of buildings that we use, churches, halls, shops and kindergartens, are both workplaces in OHS, but they are also places that qualify for essential safety measures to be installed. Because effectively they're places where multiple people gather at a time. And that's the criteria, the difference between, for example, a residential house that you or I might live in day to day, that's not a building which requires essential safety measures, but the types of buildings that we use in our day-to-day -day operations in the church do. Um, paths of travel um, are an area where OHS practice, if you like, using the building um, covers and crosses over into the ESM space. So the exit door and the hardware attached to that exit door and the way it swings, that's governed by um, um, essential safety measures. And OHS says you can't stack up boxes in front of the door. 
um, the green running person sign above the door or um, illuminated or painted, that's an ESM. Um, so in that context, there's an interrelationship between occupational health and safety, how you use a building and the things in the building that keep people safe in the event of a disaster. The upshot of it is that um, ESMs are a bit of a specialist area and it's not something you decide yourself. Um, a building surveyor decides them for us, um, either through a maintenance determination for those buildings that don't have an occupancy certificate or it is prescribed by a building surveyor on an occupancy permit when it's issued at the time of um, building completion. So what do we have to do? Um, we have to maintain ESMs. If they're not there and not fit for purpose, they have to be installed so that they are in place and are maintained to be in place. You have to keep records of that and you have to report on the maintenance of the ESMs annually. There are certain other responsibilities that vest on people occupying the building. So a tenant, for example, uh, in a retail shop or an op shop, um, they may have to pay for the cost of the ESMs and testing of them. But however, they are not obliged to actually do that work themselves. The owner sits with the owner or in our organisation, the responsible body for the property. Um, so what do you actually have to do? Uh, for buildings built after July 1994, where there will be an occupancy permit um, issued for the building which has the ESMs and their maintenance schedule specified, that needs to be displayed um, and it needs to be adhered to in terms of the maintenance schedule. So if, however, you have a building that wasn't um, built after 1994 or significantly changed, um, you need to either ha already have a, get a maintenance determination, which you adhere to from a registered building surveyor to maintain the uh, measures in an appropriate manner. And if you don't have one, you need to get one. Now that can't be done by myself or Duncan or one of my team. It's something you need to get a registered building surveyor to do because it has to be done in accordance with the Victorian building regulations and a very narrow definition of what is allowable and what is not allowable, or what is required and what um, you can do without. So it's a specialist area and there's a legal um, requirement to have a registered building surveyor actually do that assessment for you. Um, once you've got that um, understanding, either through the occupancy permit or the um, de maintenance determination, you need to maintain the um, essential safety measures in accordance with the requirements. You need to keep a logbook. And that means that the maintenance of those um, ESMs needs to be done through qualified contractors. So testing of smoke alarm systems, testing of um, exit, emergency exit lighting, that is done through a registered um, um, practitioner in those areas. It's not something that um, you can just say yourself, I'm gonna check that the lights come on. It has to be done and certified by a registered electrician, for example. Um, there are a number of specialist organisations do provide these services and they'll be um, information on those will be provided through to um, you as a support service from um, property services. The next step is on each anniversary of either the original occupancy permit or the date the maintenance schedule was prepared, you have to report annually on what you've done in the last year. Now, whilst the report can be signed by a party, who could be a member of church council or anyone else, the actual assessment of the maintenance work that has been done is best done by um, someone who understands the um, requirements explicitly and also is prepared to take on the obligation of when they sign off on the annual report, they take the obligation and the liability for saying it has been done correctly and it has been done in accordance with the requirements. So, our strong suggestion is that you make use of um, an external provider to um, get that sign off on the um, annual safety report as well, even though it doesn't need to be signed by a registered building surveyor. Um, it can be signed off when um, the party signing it off is confident that what should have been done has been done. Um, why do they apply to us? I touched on this briefly earlier. Um, we have lots of people into our buildings and as such a place of public gathering um, typically is a class nine building and more often than not in our case a class nine B building. Um, they are required to have essential safety measures incorporated into their um, service and also into their maintenance schedule. There are certain other classes of buildings such as op shops or retail shops that we might have tenants in where they apply because they're at, um, um, a retail premises. Why do you as a church council have this responsibility sitting on your shoulders is a good question. Um, 
whilst the legal owner of the property in the church is the property trust, that's a matter of convenience set up by the Act of Union that created the Uniting Church in 1977. It said that the Commonwealth's property of the church is held by the trust, but it's held on behalf of parties who use it. It's held for the benefit of a congregation or an agency of the church. And that agency in the church is for um, congregation or church council is described as a responsible body. So the responsible body is the entity within our structure that has the responsibility to manage and use the property and look after it in the way as it may be required from time to time by the law and by any other regulation. So our internal rules and uh, the Act of Union that uh, created the church says basically the onus lies on the church council to make sure that for a church building that is required to have ESMs, that they are the party or the entity that needs to make sure that things are done in the right manner. Now, we know that that's not something that is day-to-day -day business for members of church council. So that's why there's um, such a strong level of support um, being provided around um, contractors to assist with work and um, to measure and define the work that is required. Um, it varies a lot across congregations. We found that typically, this is something that is not dealt with as well as it could be or must be according to law. There are a few congregations who actually really pleasantly surprise us. They've got, they're across it, they've got the determination or they've got a planning, uh, an occupancy permit and they've been doing that and getting various contractors into sign off it on six monthly or quarterly basis as required. Um, so that's the exception rather than the norm though. So I'd love to have 600 pleasant surprises, but I, I'm very much suspecting we won't I'm seeing you smile there, Duncan. Um, so what are we doing about it? We are in the process of sending letters to all church councils. We're available for advice. We've had a lot of consultation with presbytery um, members and also with the committees of the church at both part and um, property and operations committee. Um, other members have been involved. The general secretary and moderator have reviewed um, letters and communications. So we've tried to recognise this is both a a technical area, but it's also an area very much in need of pastoral support um, for the um, implications of this um, activity. We've provided assistance in finding contractors who can help you with any works that do need to be done and um, can try to give a framework that um, lets it um, be reasonably readily understood and, um, and followed through. Um, I've got a team of people uh, who are available and able to help in various forms. Um, Commercial leases, our legal support team in um, UCA will make sure that ESM responsibility where it can be passed on from a maintenance cost point of view is passed on to tenants. So it doesn't become a, an impost that we bear on behalf of somebody else. Um, we can help with um, relationships with the uniting because uniting where they use church properties should be paying their way and taking up the obligation around um, ESMs as well as any external tenant should. So we will keep a weather eye out um, for what, uh, whilst we're not building surveillance, we will watch for what we see. And um, from experience, if we see something that isn't appropriate, we'll call it to people's attention. But we're not the ESM police. We're here to help, uh, I guess would be the way I'd describe it. So please take it um, in the vein that's meant. Um, if we do pull people up on extinguishers that have not been tested or had their um, tags stamped, et cetera, et cetera, all things left in the way of doors or lights that don't work. Um, you can get assistance from presbytery, obviously, as a first point of contact. Um, for example, in your patch, Duncan and his team are only too happy to help. Um, and also um, my, myself or anyone in my team um, is able to help as well. The, the intent is we've written this as something that hopefully can be taken away and put on the coffee table as a, a, a resource um, to, to answer some of the common questions. I mentioned also that one other person, uh, Rob Nosco, has done a bit of work preparing a paper that is that is more practical and focused at um, simple steps is what you do, uh, as opposed to me telling you, this is, the, this is the structure of the legislation. If you've got a simple step that says, okay, what do I do now? Um, there's, a, there's quite a good, um, if you like, ESM for dummies guide that, um, that Rob has prepared and I saw it um, run through today. So that will be available as well. Question um, in your docs and presentation, you talked about Statcom. Um, Question is, are they a registered building surveyor? Because you've also mentioned another three in the documentation that um, you sent through on the zip file. So is Statcom a registered building surveyor? And you mentioned that you've got the choice of another three as well. Um, first comment, um, you are not obliged to use Statcom. 
Um, we have an arrangement with Statcom around what they will provide as a service to us. They do have a registered building surveyor within their team, but they also have other people who are qualified to assess the maintenance records and sign off on the annual report and um, to check that maintenance has been done and logged in an appropriate fashion. So they, if you like, they have an audit role, they do have a responsible building surveyor capability as well. Um, however, you can use a local practitioner um, if you are, particularly in regional and rural areas, we're finding um, they, they may have an RBS that is already available and um, doing work on a site um, or has done work on a site previously, and that may be more cost-effective, availability ready, whatever it might be to serve them. Um, we are also conscious that um, there's more than one responsible building surveyor in the marketplace. So we, we, we've provided names of two or three other ones, but there's no obligation to use any particular um, RBS. Um, the only thing we do say is that when you're getting, if you don't have an occupancy permit with the conditions on it, you do need an RBS to actually develop your maintenance schedule. You can't do it yourself or you can't do it through a non-qualified person. Yeah. Just with um, SATCOM, um, we do have those rates um, negotiated with them based on um, the large volume that is the Uniting Church. So um, the idea is that um, as people make contact with SATCOM uh, requesting a maintenance determination, that we will then coordinate that um, attendance on site of the registered building surveyor. So we want to try and, um, I guess, maximise the discount in terms of having you know, um, the registered building surveyor go to, you know, three or four different sites on the one day um, that are close together to minimise that travel cost. Um, it, from our session today, I understand, and I knew this anyway, that those costs are quite reasonable that we've put forward in terms of a maintenance determination. Um, they can be quite expensive. So, for example, Siobhan, uh, if we were the peninsula congregations work together to to work with statcom that would make a lot of sense wouldn't it it yeah definitely um in the idea moving forward is that um because uh, i liaise with statcom regularly about what what sites are signing up and um what we'll be doing is making sure that um, we make the best use of that time so that we can have the groups um you know coupled together that are regionally make sense for them yeah. to attend mm. It sounds like stack time is recommended, but you don't have to if you don't want to. Of course, we, we're not yep. forcing anyone to use any particular contract. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So you've been made an offer you can refuse. <laughs> okay. In the presentation, test and tag was mentioned. And I just wanted to clarify, is that uh, come under the, uh, there might be good reasons for doing it and uh, it might be required under other regulations, but is it required under this uh, essential uh, safety measures regulation? Uh, no, no, strictly speaking, no, it's not. Um, I, I made mention of it uh, not in the context of test and tag of electrical appliances, as there's a periodic safety check on the um, electrical insulation on them. Um, it's more a case of saying an extinguisher has a yellow tag on it. And when that extinguisher is checked for pressure or refilled or serviced periodically, they usually get a little um, stamp and um, put a, um, a stamp in the, in the month and year of the service. Um, so you inspect those tags, um, and that, that is an ESM measure, um, and the maintenance of it is evidenced by that tag on the extinguisher, but it's different from the electrical test and tag, which is a highly recommended activity, um, but it's, it, it's not, strictly speaking, an ESM requirement. So, yeah, um, electrical test and tag actually falls under the occup occupational health and safety legislation, so it's about um, keeping the workplace safe. Mm -hmm. um, so in the... Um, I guess paraphernalia or the documentation that's been sent to all the church councils. Um, we have um, got a return sheet that we've asked church councils to provide if they're interested in a, um, I guess, a, a bulk buy of the contractors. So be that the contractors who service the ESMs, but also the contractors who do the test and tag. So we are um, sort of trying to make the most of um, the um, the buying power, the procurement power that we have in the volume that is um, the presbyteries and, and the congregations across the Synod. Thanks, Siobhan. Now, David Hyam. Uh, just a couple of queries, uh, Peter. The uh, question of the occupancy uh, certificate for if it's a building that's all older than, uh, younger than 94. Now, when you, if it's an older building and you get the maintenance 
uh, side of it. You don't end up with an occupancy certificate. You only get an, an occupancy certificate if it's a new building. Is that right? Uh, um, the uh, maintenance determination gives you what you need to satisfy the ESM maintenance schedule and then get your annual report produced, but it doesn't produce you with an occupancy. It doesn't give you an occupancy certificate for a building, no. No, and you don't, you don't need one if it's older than nine, 1994? Um, what you'll probably find is that it may well have been issued in the past, but until 1994, the occupancy certificate did not need to specify the essential service, uh, essential safety measures and their maintenance schedule. Right, okay. Uh, and then just the second thing, uh, Siobhan, am I understanding that if uh, a congregation wants to use the facilities of Statcom, for example, that it's better to tell you rather than go to them direct so that you liaise. Is that what you want us to do? Either or. We're, oh, sorry. We're in cahoots. All <laughs> we, right. are, okay. we are talking regularly. And um, for instance, talking to Aaron at Statcom today, um, I, I received the, um, I guess, the printout from Presbytery of all the congregations who have now received the letter. So I'm collating all of that so that we can actually have an idea of, of where that's all and they'll be sharing that with statcom so that we can make sure that we're um tic tacking together to to use okay. the, yeah 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 all right that's great thanks Paul. my my query is more to do with edith Fowler. at the moment it's only used by a table tennis club and a, and as the church office um so how, how would how would the esm affect that if 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 for example we move the table tennis club to Chelsea and close the office down will be need an ESM certificate or uh, for either file. Um, it probably goes to the classification of the building under its um, occupancy certificate and the original um, approval for the construction of the building. Um, in the same way that you can potentially trigger a change of use by using your building for something other than its original intended purpose. Just the fact that you're not using a building for its intended purpose does not automatically default it to another use where you don't have to maintain ESMs. So if it's a place of gathering at the moment in terms of its building classification, which it sounds like it probably is with the ancillary offices on it, um, and it does cover halls as well as the church, they're all covered under the one um, gamut. So it's not like this room is an ESM liable room and this one isn't. Um, it tends to be the building at a whole that is classified. So I think moving the table tennis club out would not change the classification and not remove your obligations to maintain it. Yeah, Peter, could you tell us something about if uh, the property is going to be sold in the next year? There's something else about that? Um, the sad reality is that if you're not using it and you're not occupying it and you're selling it, you still need to maintain ESMs. Right. So, so what we've put on offer is that we will just do a... Um, almost like a, a level of make safe kind of um, so make so I think we've called it a gap analysis um, for four hundred dollars but it's it's with the view that the property will be sold within within the year so it's not um, a long term um, offering and it would you know it had been with consultation with the presbytery so I, I, I um, describe it as the ESM light. Um, it's doing what we absolutely have to, but trying to, to not spend money when it's not absolutely essential to do so. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. All right. How about Colin? Colin? Thank you, Duncan. Um, I noticed in the question and answers paper, there's a requirement to report by the end of February 2022. Will there be a template produced for congregations so that they can easily record their activities and, and facilitate that reporting process? Uh, good question, Colin. Um, uh, the February um, reporting back would, is more about um, internally, say, within the Synod office, understanding where we're at. So it would be more around, you know, we've got 60 congregations have all signed up with Statcom and they've, you know, 50% of those have had their maintenance disseminations. But I'll take on board your query about a feedback item, but I'll, I'll, I'll slot it into 2022. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, thank you. That would, I think that would help uh, yeah. facilitate the process and, and also standardise yeah. the information that you'll be receiving. That's right. Well, one, um, one aspect of that is um, with SATCOM, there is a, 
there's access to a web portal. So um, each group that signs up um, with Statcom will be able to use a web portal um, for their premises, so for their um, church site, which will show um, the reporting. Um, and then from my point of view, um, we are given an across the board access. So actually, I actually will be able to see your reports as well. So um, there's, there's quite a few benefits in their system. Well, one of the benefits of using Statcom is that that when, when they take a congregation on, they set the congregation up and its buildings, and then they will um, find out what contractors you're using for your maintenance, and they will send emails to um, the relevant contractor saying, this building needs to have its ESM check on the 1st of July or the 1st of September or whatever it is. And if they don't get a confirming email back that that check has been done, they'll bring it to the, uh, it'll come up as an exception. So they do a lot of that background management of what needs to be done for you. So. Um, you sort of so it's it's not just the on-site attendance. There's a quite quite a bit more, such as um, Siobhan just mentioned around the website, but also some information management and notifications to contractors that are handled by Statcom as well to take some of that administrative load off the congregation. Yeah, that's good. Okay, thank you. Another mm -hmm. question, yep. question, yep. Duncan Probably. is there seems to be some overlap between the, this and the occupational health and safety manual. What's the current edition of the uh, Occupational Health and Safety Manual? And is there another one coming out in the not too distant future? The, the OHS manual is undergoing review at the moment. El Nura has been working on that um, um, in the background along with um, all sorts of things COVID related. Um, so that uh, has obviously taken a bite out of her time to, to devote to that. But um, we're conscious that that does need updating. And um, the, the two, it, they probably overlap's not the right word uh, for how OHNS and ESMs work, but they actually interleave together. They interreact and interleave together in terms of the use of the building and the services and facilities provided within the building. So in that context, um, yes, they do need to be brought up to date and um, uh, that, that's part of the work that we're doing, Cole. Uh, I think Colin as well, if you're familiar with the OHNS manual, um, that used to have a um, self-managed tool. It was this um, black and red one pager. So that um, is not a compliant document and that's been removed from the manual. So um, we are moving towards now making sure that it's either you've got an occupancy permit or you need to obtain a maintenance determination in a schedule. And that's, that's the criteria. Okay, thank you. Just one other quick question. In one of our churches, we've got two separate buildings on the same property. What do we need to do about that? So my understanding, so that would be treated like a, com a complex or a church complex. So are you okay. saying it's like the church and the hall? Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, so yes. when, when they come out and do the maintenance determination, it will be for the site. So it will include both of those. Thank you. Dep depending on the site setup, you may need to carry two logbooks, one for each building, because it's usually desirable that the, the ESM logbook is kept in close proximity to the building um, which it supports. Thank you. Now, how about we go to David and Fran? Yeah, oh, David from Mount Waverley, St John's. Um, we have uh, FES companies regularly service our fire extinguishers, but um, I doubt whether too many of our members or tenants actually know how to use them. Um, has Siobhan or Peter any uh, any support in this area? We can have it. We can take that question on notice. It's it's training. There is training available for um, you know fire. I've I've done it. I've done chief warden training and warden training, and it includes all that that sort of stuff. Um, I, I'm happy to take that on notice. That question and, and get back to you, David, on that. Good. Thank you. Yeah. That's a good idea, though, if you have multiple tenants in a property, to have a, at least one session every now and then to do that. Uh, and Catherine, also at St John's. Yeah, my question's about records and, and the logbook and so on. And when you're talking about the logbook and keeping a record of the maintenance that's done. Um, does the documentation that Statcom provide when they do the, when they develop the, well, whatever the tool is called, I'm losing my initial term. Yeah. Um, does, does that document 
contain a place to keep a record of the maintenance? Does it basically have the schedule where you sign off when it's been done so that when it comes to your reporting, you can go, here it is, it's all in this one spot. Uh, the, that's exactly right. They do provide that. Um, my, one of the services they provide is to, um, one, provide a storage cabinet for the logbook and to provide the logbook that sits in that storage cabinet and it's then incumbent on each of the service contractors as they come to do the, for example, the, 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 the green elect illuminated signs for exit notification or to um, um, fire extinguisher checks or fire hose reel checks and things like that that they actually complete the logbook at the time it's done. And then the audit at the end of the year that produces the annual safety report, ESM report, relies upon the logbook and it checks the contractor's records in that logbook of having tested this when they should have and having done it and signed it off the right way. Yep, that's great, um, thank in you. In terms of the annual report, um, the other thing that um, Statcom do or any other provider in that space will do is have a standard format um, annual ESM report format so that it covers the things that it needs to at regulation and it's a consistent document for your site to somebody else's to somebody else's. Okay. Great, thanks. Means we're not having to chase around, you know, who's got this, who's got that. It's all in the yeah. one place. That was Absolutely. my concern. Thank you very much. Right, on to Gavin Fakeney. Uh, well, it's just um, a question. We have um, buildings that are of diff different ageing and none of them are post 94 but um, there's one that goes way back to, 90, to the 1960s, one that goes to the 1990s and another one which was approaching 1994 uh, where it was a, um, it was a kindergarten um, and it actually um, uh, <clears throat> had a, an addition of a foyer to the building. Now, these are all different age buildings. The ESM will cover the four, the four of them, the three of them, as I understand. But do we need to get occupancy certificates for those buildings, or we just rely on the schedule, the termination schedule? Um, because you don't have an occupancy certificate, you probably do. You just we do have we do have some, yeah. And um, it won't have, because of the age of the buildings, pre-94, it won't have the maintenance schedule no. that the ESM specified on it. So what you do need to adhere to the ESM requirements is an ESM maintenance schedule. So mm -hmm. that's what you need the building surveyor to come and prepare for you. And it will cover the buildings in the complex. It may be there's a schedule for each building, given their different types and uses yeah. and conditions. Uh, but that's, <coughs> that, that's what you need to then adhere to from a maintenance point, point of view going forward. And one, one, one of the buildings is the preschool, which is um, occupied by Uniting. Um, should they be contributing to this? It's one that, um, that will come up from time to time around kindies, given a lot of kindies are run by yeah. um, Uniting. Um, they may not bear the full cost of the ESMs, but they should be contributing in part to the ESM cost for the site. Is, the, is it possible to give some um, fairly simple explanation of um, whether it's uh, specifically the changes to the building regs back in 2018 that sort of has it, um, have they increased the, the, um, the frequency of, uh, of testing? Is that a factor in, in uh, this? Peter, do you mind if I jump in on this one? So, um, John, today when we had a session with PPW, we had a um, registered building surveyor who is the one that works with Statcom, who was a part of that call. And um, one of the questions was, okay, if I've got a, you know, this is one of the regional groups, if I have a building um, that is literally, you know, a small building with two doors, why do I have to go to all this, this trouble? And um, the bottom line is that um, this legislation has been here for a long time, that um, the maintenance determination is is required, particularly for these historical buildings. You, you know, we you've just got no records of that. You know, the um, ESMs being um, installed properly or any anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and essentially, the landscape has changed. So his explanation was that um, if you asked them five years ago um, about ESMs, they would have said. Yes, ESMs are pretty terrible across the board, across the state. And there's a lot of work that, um, 
yeah, companies and um, organisations need to do to, to get up to speed. Um, but now, if you ask him present time, um, given what's happened, especially with the cladding, um, the Victorian Building Authority has um, taken, um, taken the lead or, or um, taken with gusto um, the need to actually get the community um, uh, you know, on board and, and correcting their, their ESM programs to actually have it in place um, and to, to be compliant. Whereas, um, yeah, it, it just has not been the case. And it's, we're not the only organisation, it's, it's across the board because it applies to every non-residential building. So a, a building that you don't, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's certainly the cladding, I think, that has changed the landscape and then the Victorian Building Authority um, making that big push. And I'll actually just mention that it was in the paperwork, but the Victorian Building Authority has a lot of great resources. Um, some, there's some good podcasts there, um, some, um, yeah, some videos that are worth watching just to have a, a, a better understanding of um, ESMs as well. Mm -hmm. Peter, did you want to add any more to that? Uh, no, I, I think that's um, a, a very good summary, Siobhan, and thank you. The, Essentially, it's an issue of profile. It's now out there front and centre with a very bright light shining on it. Um, not much has really changed behind the scenes in what you should have been doing as a building owner or operator. Um, it's just that it's getting a lot higher focus and a lot higher profile. Part of that is driven by liability and part of it is driven by the reality of everybody getting a very sharp shock with the cladding fires that occurred and the disastrous discoveries they made about the state of ESMs in the buildings that were affected by those cladding fires. So it's, um, mm -hmm. now, now the government has got interested in a regulatory point of view. Um, the penalties um, are being applied more readily now and they're, um, they're getting, as I said, sharper teeth and longer teeth. Thank you. How about we go to Raymond? Uh, I'm from uh, Western Port Parish. We've got three congregations in Oxshop. So that means we're going to have four lots of um, cost to our uh, parish, is that correct? On three different sites. Uh, four different sites. We've got four three sites. churches mm -hmm. in different villages and an op shop separate. So we're going to have four lots of cost, which is going to be a fair drain on the congregation. There, there may be some economy of scale, uh, given they're all under your one banner. But the reality is they're four separate buildings in four separate places and they all need to be compliant. That's um, a, an unfortunate financial reality I feel, I feel for you. Uh, no question of that. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that's just... If they were all four buildings in the one place, there'd be a better answer, but they're not. Thank you for your pastoral concern, Peter. Um, Any help uh, yes. for, for the cost? The, uh, the, this is going to become quite a, a critical issue for some of our congregations when we have quite a number of buildings on different sites. That's, that's certainly an issue for us. And uh, the presentry is certainly, uh, I, I don't think we can solve that for congregations, but we're there to, to help you through this, this time, that's for sure. Uh, Gavin might want to say something more from a property committee point of view. Unfortunately, um... The finances of the presbytery won't allow us to subsidise or even, or well, certainly not to meet the costs of congregations, but even subsidising them will be difficult. As Peter said, if there's a, a situation like you have it uh, down there, uh, the four separate properties, you may be able to have um, uh, some degree of recognition that they are all your properties and therefore not a full fee for each one, but maybe a reduced fee for each one. But that's the reality of the situation, unfortunately. Um, the same, where... same thing applies, doesn't it, Gavin, that the rising cost of insurance of our buildings is going to be... Another, very... It's another issue again, another yes. Issue. Mm. And, and, and the, these, are, these are realities that we are facing uh, across the presbytery with um, congregations of all sizes and, and uh, ages and income. So it's, it's, a, it's a difficult situation and we might have to sort of have some conversations about that with various people. Hmm. So it comes down again, at the end of the day is what can we sustain for the long term? Yeah. In terms of our property footprint. 
it's a, I'm, it's, uh, sad to uh, to bring it up, but it's actually it's, this is um, this is what we're talking about tonight, and alongside other issues, will be possibly game changers for some congregations in terms of how they think about their properties. Mm. Just uh, we're talking about costs. Is there indicative costs for the service that uh, Satcom provide? So we've. Um... Oh, I don't have the paperwork right in front of me, but uh, I understand that we you should. Uh, so two thousand dollars is what we're thinking for the maintenance determination, and that's a one-off cost. Yeah. And then um, to set up with Statcom, um, it's eight hundred and fifty dollars if you choose to include the um, what's the red cabinet. Uh, that's another one hundred and fifty dollars, and then. Um, moving forward annually, the cost is six hundred dollars charged quarterly, so one hundred and fifty dollars a quarter. Um, that would be the ongoing cost. Okay, thank you. Peter, go ahead. It's a question we've had several times. Um, when do we have to have this done by? Um, the 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 trite answer is about five years ago. In, in the practical reality, we we'd like to see um, at least as an absolute minimum, get an understanding of what your obligations are on site that you're not meeting at the moment. So that means either referring to your occupancy certificate and understanding whether you are maintaining in accordance with that occupancy certificate, or if you don't have one, getting the maintenance determination done so you at least understand what your obligations are and where you are non-compliant at the present time with what you should have in place. Um, the nature of this sort of thing is that if, if you do have an, an event and somebody um, is injured or at worst dies as a result of that event, if you are doing the right thing and trying to move down the path of getting to compliance and getting to regulatory um, um, satisfaction in terms of what you should have on site to protect people, um, it, it, it holds a lot of weight in any consideration of liability around actions. If, however, you've been told that you need to do this and you've done nothing on it, and so there's a fire and somebody dies, then you've got a very difficult um, explanation to give to people and give to the authorities over why you didn't put in practice some of the things done. So it's not for me to tell you that you've got um, until the 1st of January or 31st of December or a particular day to simply just make sure that you're informed and aware of what your obligations are and that you understand the repercussions of not doing things if there is an adverse event. Um, well, having said that, we'd like you to get on with it as quickly as you can and we'll support you in every way we possibly can to do that. Uh, okay. The other but element is just in lockdown, um, it's essential safety measures. Um, they need to be tested regardless of a, a building being used or not. And in some ways, uh, lockdown actually put the greater risk of potential fire in a space that isn't being frequently used by people. So... Um, yeah, it's, it's just something that we need to, to get on with. Hence, we're, we're having this session now and we're here to help help the congregations um, to do that. Um, Peter, you mentioned something earlier about um, buildings being, the possibility of being, buildings being sold or imminent sale um, and something about sort of a almost makeshift, if you know what I mean, rather than the full cost perhaps being taken on by congregations for buildings that are being sold? There, there, there are two potential um, opportunities there to, to not spend money when we don't have to, absolutely have to, which I think is what you're asking. If something is imminently going to be sold, let's not spend um, unless we absolutely have to. That makes um, good sense. Uh, one, one avenue is that um, we would, uh, if something has to be done, and we've got an imminent sale, I'm not afraid to pick up the tab at synod level and then offset it against the backdrop of um, sales proceeds when they come through. That's one pathway that would take the immediate pressure off a congregation. If we have certainty over a property being sold, we can, we can pick up the tab in the meantime for six months or whatever it is until the property is sold. There's no problem with that. Um, the other comment would be that there, there are ways in which you can reduce your maintenance cost um, for ESMs if a building is, um, if you like, lying idle and dormant pending sale. You can't eliminate it, but you, you might be able to knock a few hundred dollars off. It's, it's that sort of scale and it's it's building dependent. Um, we hope to be able to do that and run it, if you like, a, a, as I say, ESM light was the phrase I used. Um, yeah. If we have full knowledge and firm commitment to a sale in a period of time, we can probably take a, a balanced risk in that area. 
over what we do and what we don't do. It's, it's a bit daunting. It's been daunting for us to say, how the heck do we deal with this as a church? Um, and uh, we do understand the impact upon congregations and the knife edge on which many are running at the moment. So uh, it's, uh, it's not being done without feeling and without some degree of empathy and uh, understanding the pastoral issues. So uh, if, we're, if we're doing things a bit too harshly or a bit too quickly, pull us up um, because it's very easy to get task focused and not actually recognise the people and the, and the, um, uh, the pastoral issues around this as well. So um, um, help, help us to help you would be my request. And thank you for the opportunity tonight.